Hello and welcome to the Adventure Films Podcast. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking 10 adventure films and we're going to discuss what we think adventure films are um, in a minute and uh, we're going to discuss each one per podcast. So this first one is all about the 1933 film King Kong. Uh, now first of all, who are we who are discussing um, King Kong and all these adventure films? Um, well, my name's Aaron Ewing and um, I'm a comic artist and writer I do an, 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 and this is where my interest in adventure films comes from because I, I write and draw adventure comics um, specifically a sort of Tintin-esque adventure story called The Rainbow Orchid um, so that's my interest in adventure films and um, I'll be discussing King Kong with my brother Murray Ewing Hello, I'm Murray Ewing, and uh, just to give a bit, a bit of background on my interest in this, um, I am a writer, write short stories, mostly horror, fantasy, science fiction, um, but um, I think we're both interested in films generally, fantasy films as well, and um, one of the things we're interested in looking at is the storytelling aspects of these films. Yes, neither of us are particularly film historians, okay. so you're not going to get um, the history and technical background to King Kong. I mean, we'll try our best, but please don't be too harsh if we get things um, drastically wrong, which I'm sure we will. So we're just discussing this in a very quite casual manner, really. Um, now, one thing I'm particularly interested in, and, and the reason what I did was I made this list, I've had it in mind for a while, of what are my favourite adventure films. And so I made a list of ten. They're in no particular order. Um, I've got many more favourite films than ten, of course. Um, but I, you know, needed a finite number. And um, so I made this kind of arbitrary list. But they are they are quite long term my favourite. They've been long held favourites for me. Um, and I tried to obviously when you do this, you have to define what an adventure film is. Now at its widest, um, almost every story is an adventure film, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, you know, um, Great Expectations is is an adventure story. Um, I, I mean, tell me any story that's not an adventure of some kind. That's what makes it an interesting story. But so I'm really defining it as as a genre, but also very much biased towards my own um, um, likes and dislikes. Um, so my sort of definition is actually, I admit, very fuzzy, but it kind of involves. It's usually set in the real world and involves um, a journey, exploration, a quest um, into something a bit more fantastical, maybe. Um, not necessarily, um, um, but I think all these films are journeys of a kind. I mean, how, how would you sort of it's decide or respond to that adventure? <laughs> a terrible um, definition. <laughs> it's definitely a journey into somewhere different. I mean, quite often their journey, the ones you've chosen, the journeys into lost worlds, or the journeys into worlds which are shut off from the modern world where things start. Oh, yes, so yes. So it's a completely different place. Mm. Uh, and it almost has a feeling of being a separate world entirely. You go there and you can't phone the outside world, you can't talk to anyone. It's really a place of its own. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, perhaps I should just say the ten films um, that I... I decided upon. So, uh, as I say, these are in no order of preference, but these are the order I put them on my list. Um, so the first one is the 1933 King Kong, and the next one is The Man Who Would Be King, 1975, which is based on the um, Rudyard Kipling story. Um, then we've got The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, 1948. Um, Akira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress from 1958. Then Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which is 1962. Time Bandits, 1981. Uh, going back to the 30s, Lost Horizon, which is the 1937 version. Um, Raised of the Lost Ark, 1981. Um, she, from 1935. There's been several versions of that as well. And finally, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, from 1974. Um, now, all of these kind of define how I see adventure films, adventure stories. 
Um, but also they've all got bits you could say, well, that doesn't fit into the definition somehow. Um, yeah. But we'll discuss the films, obviously, uh, independently. Um, so um, I think, have you got anything to add about the adventure well, film? Well, I'd say that part of the fun of this is we're going to be trying to find out what exactly Garen means by adventure <laughs> films. <laughs> And it's not going to be, um, we're not going to be saying, oh, that fails the test because it doesn't fit in. It's really, they're all good films. They've all got this feeling of adventure, if nothing else. Yeah. And we're going to be looking into them and trying, just thinking about what is it that gives them that feeling of adventure. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I put this out, I put this on Facebook and I put it out to, after I'd done the list, what what are your favourite adventure films? And a lot of people agreed with, with my 10 and said and I had a few comments saying well I can't think of any others yeah. um, I had someone else say you know, The Matrix which you can't you can't say isn't an adventure film yeah. but for me it's kind of sometimes a genre will trump adventure um, so like for me um, The Matrix would probably be science fiction over adventure mm. um, I really like war films um, Where Eagles Dare uh, Bridge Too Far yeah. They're adventure films, but the genre of war film trumps the the category possibly of adventure film. Yeah, yeah. And these are very kind of classic adventure. And and I must say I'm very biased because this is the Rainbow Orchid territory, my my mm. own comic. It's very much in that territory, and uh, you could probably say all these films to some extent probably informed the Rainbow Orchid. Um, but anyway, that's sub tissue. So I think we've kind of. I'm completely confused you on what I think adventure film is, but <laughs> I, uh, it's funny actually. A lot of people kind of inherently know yeah, what I yeah, mean. Yeah. I mean, it's an adventure with a capital A rather than adventure with a small A, which, yeah. as I say, that could cover so many things. So, shall we get to talking about King Kong? Yes. We both watched it about two weeks ago now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's not massively fresh in our memory, but I've seen it several times. Have, have yeah, you? yeah, I've seen it a lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, just some facts about it. So it's 1933, so um, just a few years after the silent era. It was produced and directed by Marion C. Cooper, and he had a partner whose name I, is less famous because I don't know his name. I didn't write that down. Um, <laughs> um, it stars, um, well, Fay Ray is the, is the famous the only name I know from it, Fay Ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, Fay Ray, absolutely stunning in the film. Um, the other name from it that I recognised is Willis O'Brien. Of course, yeah. Who did the effects and who, of course, was um, who apprenticed Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, who was probably my introduction. I imagine the same to you. I wish, I mean, your favourite films are very often informed by the era you grew up in. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I grew up in the 70s and into the 80s I was born in 69 Murray's uh, two years younger than me so pretty much the same era so those 1970s adventure films and early 80s of which mm. so the Sinbad films Harryhausen yeah were a real core staple of what we grew up on yeah those and the Doug McClure yeah <laughs> less, less technically impressive yeah um, although I think we saw it at the time when that didn't impinge oh no <laughs> no no they were they were brilliant um, yeah I mean, it may be significant. The oldest film you got, you got two from nineteen eighty one. Those are the, yeah, they're the newest, aren't they? Yeah. Um, oh, did I say the oldest? I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> newest, yeah. Um, yes, that's interesting. Um, and I have wondered recently if I'm I'm becoming a bit of an old git and having a stronger reaction <laughs> to new things. Yeah. Just because they're new, and I'm worried about that. Now it's not totally true because there's a lot of new stuff that comes out that I do really like. Yeah. Um, but we'll talk about the new King Kong, Peter Jackson's, a little bit later, although we both saw that when it came out and yeah. not since. Yeah, which so, probably says something. <laughs> well, I, I watching King Kong again, I did think, oh, I do want to now compare that again. Yeah. Uh, but we'll talk about that a bit later, perhaps. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, Ray Harryhausen was, was really a, a starting point for a lot of this adventure, introduction into this yeah. kind of adventure, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Ray Harryhausen famously saw King Kong at the Chinese theatre, Grauman's Chinese Theatre in uh, Hollywood, Los Angeles. And I always remember him saying, I think, I think this is right, he walked in and they had, I don't know if it was the actual Kong head, <laughs> really? the big one, oh, right. or, or, a, or a facsimile of it, and that made a huge impression of it, of, on him, and then of course the film blew him away. Yeah. Um... And the technical aspects of it, 
still work, don't they? Yeah. I mean, something about effects, which I always feel, is um, after a while, thing, I mean, when things aren't trying to... No, when you can no longer take something as realistic... I mean, no one seeing King Kong nowadays would say, that is an enormous ape, how did they do it? Which I think <laughs> they did say at the time, they just mm. couldn't work out how they'd done it. Yeah. I think now you can look at it on an, as an artistic thing you know one part of your brain knows that it's an animatronic miniature but also you appreciate it for the artistry of how they moved it how they made it mm. so you're not looking at it in disbelief but you're not looking at it in absolute belief either you know no, I mean? no, but it doesn't take you out of the film. You're not no. looking. Oh, here comes King Kong. Oh, look how they made him move there. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still wrapped up in giant ape chasing people across an island, mm. um, knocking them off a log. It still gives me a thrill mm. to see it. I'm not thinking, oh, how clever. Yeah, I mean, I am sometimes as well, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the experience. Uh, and some films do do that. Mm. Um, something technical will encroach on your yeah. on your on the story telling experience and it takes you out of it momentarily which is not good yeah one i don't the, find that with king kong one of the things with kong is you do look at the expression on kong's face and you don't think how do they do that you do you feel what he feels you know it's just like responding to an actor and he's very sympathetic um at, towards the end when mm. he's on top of the empire state building and he's been shot and he's looking he's holding the bullet holes and he's yeah. looking at his palm at the blood <laughs> it's really quite moving actually yeah. and um, I know in the new one is it Andy Circus? Andy Circus. yeah you know, obviously a very great character actor and he, he, I thought he did very well with Kong from what I remember yeah. but I don't feel as though it was necessarily a, um, a huge improvement no. um, and it had all the CGI and everything and it's great but this is still great yeah. 1933 stop motion animation at, you know something still at the beginning of its yeah um, of its evolution if you like still amazing and well, one thing I thought was it's amazing how looking at it it's got all the elements that Ray Harryhausen brought into his films using the same techniques like you've got human interaction with mm. the model the models you've got humans interacting with King Kong it's all in the same shot and you can see them doing it different ways like at one point there's an animatronic not animatronic there's a model man yeah. climbing up a cliff mm. behind Kong just to get them at the right scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, it's very well done. And um, there's a bit that I th always sticks out whenever I see it. His Kong's defeated the T-Rex. Yeah. And he's broken its yeah, neck. And the, or his jaw, rather. And, yeah. But he's testing its jaw. He's sort of... Yeah. And I'm, I don't know if apes, gorillas, do that mm. in reality. I imagine they probably looked into that and that's the kind of thing perhaps they do. It's such a... It seems so true. It's like just like a cat playing with a dead mouse yes. for a while. It's expecting it to react for a bit. It, it's playing tests, with it, doesn't it? Yeah, and then it looks a bit disappointed because it's dead. <laughs> but that's the point about research and and looking into that kind of little detail. Mm. And it may it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the story, but it really brings it to life when you you've you've done your homework. I mean, if if indeed gorillas do do that, yeah. but it's the kind of thing you think. Yeah, um, they possibly do. But it certainly seems very natural. The point is that it makes you realise something that's going on inside of Kong's head mm -hmm. or something he's feeling rather than just what he's doing, mm. which is reacting to something that isn't there on the screen, really. It's not reacting to the physical effect, but the emotional effect, yeah, yeah. which is a triumph, really. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was going to move on to some of the, the other aspects. We'll probably come back to... Uh, some of the model making although actually I was going to say I was going to talk about the sort of um, the ancestors of Kong oh yeah and um, I mean, one of them is definitely the 1925 silent film The Lost World right. which Willis O'Brien it kind of made his name right. that did have you yeah. ever seen that? I don't think I have um, I've seen it a while ago um, and I watched a little bit more of it recently although I didn't get through the whole thing um, and it's very similar I mean, obviously, it's based on the Conan Doyle story. Mm. Um, it it does have, I think, um, it's an early film where he did put people together with animatronic. Um, you've got me saying animatronic now. Yeah. Stop motion <laughs> um, models. 
I don't know if it was the first, um, but certainly very early and, and had a big effect. And, and I think that's probably what wowed uh, Willis O'Brien. Um, and that's the dif- that differentiates from the book in that they... Is, I think in the book they bring a pterosaur back to London mm, yeah. and he's showing it, it flies through the window. Yeah. Um, although I've also seen the BBC one they did a few years ago and I may be, I may be getting that mixed no, up. No, I read the book recently, actually. Right. That is what happens. So. I read it quite a while ago. So yeah. um, you see so many versions of things, you start <laughs> mixing them up. In the 1925 film, they bring a brontosaurus... Or actually, uh, uh, let's get it right, an apatosaurus... Yeah. Um, <laughs> back to London and it goes on the rampage and makes its way to, I think to Tower Bridge which collapses and off it swims down the, the Thames <laughs> um, Tower Bridge being a iconic London landmark of course, yeah. of course uh, with Kong we've got the Empire State Building being a, an iconic New York yes, so yeah. very similar I mean so I think Kong's a descendant of the Lost World obviously yes I also uh, going back to Doug McClure, yeah. um, there's the Edgar Rice Burroughs story. What's the one with the submarine? The uh, World the, War the, One submarine. The land that time forgot. The land that time forgot. Now, uh, <laughs> Willis O'Brien. Yeah. After Lost World, made a film called Creation, and the plot of that, although I think the film's lost apart from a few scraps, the plot of that is very similar to The Land That Time Forgot. Oh. Um, and I think because and that and they end up on an island. I think that's got a World War One yeah. submarine. They end yeah. up on an island, dinosaurs, etc. Yeah, that seems to have got into Kong. In fact, yes. most of the dinosaurs in Kong are the models that are made for creation. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, so that's so what we've got. We've got the, the Lost World, the Land That Time Forgot. Um, Marion C. Cooper made films. He was a bit of an adventurer himself and went out and made films. I think in jungles and filmed ape, real apes and stuff and he, oh, yeah. he also had an idea that he wanted to do a film where I think a, an ape a jungle ape a normal sized one yeah uh, I can't remember if it's kidnaps a girl or something like that so that's yeah. thrown into the mix so you've got very definite um, yeah. sort of ancestors of the story um, and then there's of course the descendants Ray Harryhausen I mean there's the obvious ones like Son of Kong um yeah, I don't think I've seen any other Kong films. No. Um, apart from ones called King Kong. <laughs> Harry Housen made one that, that did very well. Um, that name totally escapes me. With people shouting at the, uh, <laughs> their computers <laughs> right now, <laughs> telling me what the title is. Um, Jurassic Park, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so While I was watching King Kong, there's quite a few moments where I thought, it just reminded me of Jurassic Park, like yeah. when they're passing the dead Stegosaurus and it's breathing. Yes. Even though it's slightly different context in Jurassic Park, there's the is it a Triceratops, Triceratops or something, yeah. and it's lying on the, the ground breathing. Yeah. yeah. And it just reminded me of it. And there were a few other moments with just the shot. Um, a definite in Jurassic. I know we're talking about Jurassic Park now, but a definite. It's got to be definite. Um, uh, homage to King Kong is is the gates they go on the yes, tour. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> those must. I haven't checked, but those must be modelled on the. Yes. King Kong Gates. And talking about the King Kong Gates, they've appeared in lots of films um, besides Kong, and they actually ended up... and they're, they're, They appear in one of the other films we're going to be talking about, which is 1935 She, and they appeared in um, Gone with the Wind, <laughs> um, um, amazingly. Apparently, yeah, apparently they were, that was their last use because they were actually burned. Hmm. I think at the end of Gone with the Wind, I haven't, which I haven't seen, I don't think, at the end, the the big house in it goes up in flames. Right. Um, I don't know how they use the gates yeah. in there. I haven't seen it either. It's, <laughs> it's one of those classic films you think, I should watch that. I've never really had the interest to watch Gone with the Wind. No. There's, um, lots of others, but not that one, I'm afraid. Um, and it was in Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings, I think. Um, yeah, that, I think that's where it was first used, yeah. Oh, so it wasn't... Kong wasn't the first use? No, no. So King of Kings, that's a silent film, week. Must be, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll have to look... I'll have be interested to look that up and I don't remember it in She actually I've I've seen She several times um, I couldn't tell you exactly where they appeared there's our known position two south 90 east now you promised me some information when we reached these latitudes way west of Sumatra and way out of any waters I know I know the east Indies like I do my own hand but I've never been here where do we go from here southwest southwest 
Well, there's nothing. Nothing for thousands of miles. Keep your shirt on, Skipper. We're not going thousands of miles. Here's the island we're looking for. Well, that position is... Let's have the big chart. You won't find that island on any chart. That was made by the skipper of a Norwegian bark. Well, he must have been kidding. No, he wasn't. Listen. A canoe full of natives from this island was blown to sea. When the bark picked him up, there was only one alive. He died before they reached port, but not before the skipper had pieced together a description of the island and got a fairly good idea of where it lies. Where'd you get hold of it? In Singapore, two years ago. The skipper knew I'd be interested. Does he believe it himself? I don't know, but I do. Okay, so one thing I noticed about the start of the film mm -hmm. is it's a, it gets you into the story very quickly because you get these two characters that don't appear again. Um, a bloke approaches the dockyard and talks to one of the workers and within five minutes you've got the basics of the story because yeah. one says, oh, what's happening? Is it Carl Denham? Is that Carl Denham's ship? Uh, what's yeah. it? Oh, and he, tells, he says, oh, yes, he's going on some crazy voyage. And what do you think about that kind of exposition? Is it... Is it cheating? Should should we get that kind of thing through action? Or is it okay to have two characters walk on, <laughs> explain the background, walk off, and then we're away? Well, it's fun I didn't really think about that, actually. But it's funny, now you mention it, if you think of Shakespeare plays, particularly the historical ones, like the ones set in Rome... Um, now, I'm not going to be able to quote actual examples, <laughs> but there are quite a few where two minor characters come on. I yes, think, um, yes. Antony and Cleopatra. I'm not sure. Anyway, two minor characters come on and they say, "Oh, look what the king's doing." Oh, yeah. Is it Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Are they? Is that their function in? Um... No, not in Hamlet. Oh, okay. No, no. no, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it is. It's a, a, a technique with quite a pedigree. <laughs> well, then, if Shakespeare can do it, then we're absolutely <laughs> fine. Um, and I actually thought I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I thought no. brilliant. I just thought that's fantastic. No apology for it. Yeah. Sets you up, and I think. Um, the script went through several hands, mm. but the person most responsible for kind of really scaling it down, just getting it moving, was Marion C. Cooper's partner's, whose name I can't remember, his wife. Oh, right. R Ruth. Yes. Yeah, Ruby. I, I didn't write it oh, down. this is terrible. Anyway, so I told you, no facts here, we're just discussing the story, but I think she was given the script and really, it was her first job on the oh, script, right. I believe, and she really pared it down yeah. and um, streamlined it and just this that's why the film moves along at such a lovely pace I th yeah. there was a famous author yeah Edgar Wallace that's right came up with the idea and he started on the script but he died three days into starting yes. it yes but he was actually quite a famous British writer of I think he was British, like he was a sort of Agatha Christie uh, you know he, he wrote mysteries there was uh, Edgar, Waller mis Edgar Wallace mysteries yes I don't know if that was a radio show or right. a magazine but um he was but I don't. Th I think Marion C. Cooper had the basic idea mm, for Con, yeah, but he yeah. kind of brought him in. And uh, I don't. Th uh, Cooper said, um, "Oh, he didn't write anything." No. But then there's conflicting. Later, he actually says something like, "Oh, that," because there was a novelisation of it, of which there's bits in that aren't no. in the film. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway, he would have been an, a name to put on the poster because he right. would have drawn people to it. Do you think that was the main reason he was chosen? <laughs> could be. Than, yeah, it could yeah. be. As we're talking about the start, one thing I noticed, I, I mean, obviously the film sort of breaks down into three parts. One where they're going to uh, the island, the yeah. other one where they're on the island, and the third part where they come back to civilization. And the thing I noticed about the first part, which is um, about 40 minutes till Kong appears. Yes. Is that it's all about anticipation. Yes, I noted that myself, I, and I <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> and some of it is amazingly artificial. Yeah, I mean, in a good way. I'm not saying it's it's badly done. Yeah. But because they're making, in the film, they're making a film about, <laughs> and it's got a woman who is going to be terrified yes. of some unknown yes. creature. Yeah. There's one scene where, of course, uh, um, Carl Denham films Fay Ray's character saying you know it's just like a screen test so i might be leaping ahead here no no <laughs> but and he's saying oh you look up to the side and you see something horrible now scream you know it's all a rehearsal for a scene that comes later on foreshadowing yeah <laughs> so but also it it uh, has a double effect that when we actually get that other scene she's so much more terrified you think mm. oh that was acting but this is real yes you know. yes i thought exactly the same thing and i love that scene yeah because you actually get drawn into it because he's doing what a director did especially yeah. a silent film director when they weren't recording yeah. voices as well he'd narrate to the actors mm. 
you know, now look up and now you're seeing this. It's coming closer. The anticipation's mm. building. And you you get drawn into that yeah. in this scene. It's fantastic. Actually, I've seen a, a clip of Alfred Hitchcock doing that in one of his later films, 1970s. Oh, right. So they still did it. Well, yeah, well, he started out in the silence. So yeah. <laughs> you get your methods and, and they work for you, don't they? But one of the curious things about this is people would have gone into the film they'd have seen the poster and they probably at the time have read a lot about it because it yeah. film being the major still is now of course mm. but it's one of those things that everyone would have read about they'd know what the film's about surely they'd know it's got a giant ape in it <laughs> so the first 40 minutes you're all waiting for the ape to appear everyone knows the ape's <laughs> going to appear and it is all about stringing the audience along and yeah. building up the anticipation yeah and that's one thing uh, this, is a, this is a bugbear of mine Mm. Um, one thing I do in the Rainbow Orchid is I wanted a long build up yeah. and some people love that and that's I love them for that <laughs> others uh, criticise it because they say it does not get into the action quickly enough mm. and I was saying well okay that's fine but that's not what I like and I yeah. love Kong and other things because of that I was reading an Agatha Christie book recently Death, Death on the Nile yeah the murder, the murder doesn't happen until halfway through. Yeah. But the first half isn't boring. It's great. No. And you, you know something's going to happen, as you say. Um, uh, like with my, my thing, you know there's an adventure happening. There's, there's clues. They drag you along, uh, pull you along, rather. <laughs> not drag you along. <laughs> and um, but that anticipation is such a, a, a potent part of storytelling. Yeah. And I think so many people are keen to eject it now and get straight in. You've got to start with the big action. Okay. No, that's different. You can start with a big action scene and then slow down, have your build up, and off you go. Yeah. But so many films now leap straight into the action, and there's no yeah. slowing down or very little, no anticipation build up. Yeah. And I, I, and it's not for everyone. That's fine. I wouldn't want everything to be the same. Mm. But that's one thing I love, and it's one thing I also noticed about Kong, and, and yeah. just thought, brilliant, love yeah. it. <laughs> but the thing I, for some reason, it always brings to mind, firing an arrow. <laughs> And of course, the first thing you do is you pull back the string. That's building up the tension. Then you let go of the arrow and it flies and then it hits the target. Yes. And the target, in this case, is delivering the emotional punch of the story. Right, right, yeah. And I think that that <coughs> pulling back the bowstring is as important as letting it go. <laughs> well, if you're talking Zen and the art of archery. Yes. <laughs> absolutely, yes. And I've got one thing I noticed in this first, let's say, half an hour, 40 minutes, is that the scenes pretty much alternate between giving us um, information about where they're going slowly more and more information you know like he says where are we going and he gives them are we going to have you seen this island he shows them a map and then he says have you heard about Kong yes yes <laughs> and alternating between that and character scenes where they, right. they give you information about the characters such as the relationship between oh, okay. Anne Darrow yeah. and Jack yeah. Driscoll yes I wrote down the names <laughs> 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 which actually you might just think, oh, that's getting you into the characters. But, of course, there's a very important thing going on between... There's Anne, Anne Darrow, her relationship with Jack Driscoll is very much parallel to her relationship with Kong. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, it's sort of... It, I don't know... I haven't really worked out whether it's an alternative love story or whether they're sort of part of the same one. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it was probably... In fact, in the film... A Carl Denham isn't really bothered about having a woman, but the student no. he knows that that's what brings in the money. So yeah. he's complaining at being, "Oh, I've got to get a, yes. a girl." And so he goes and just grabs um, and yes. her off the street. Amazingly, uh, yeah. And yeah. then her first meeting with Jack Driscoll, he doesn't want her aboard. He thinks women aboard are on. Uh, you know, it's the classic romantic setup where yes. they hate each other at first, yeah. although she doesn't necessarily hate him. Um, so he is a man's man. Yes, and of course the film starts with that quote. Supposedly an old Arabian proverb. Uh, made which, up, yeah, probably. Which is, And lo, the beast looked upon the face of beauty, and it stayed its hand from killing, and from that day it was as one dead. And that idea of beauty killing the beast is throughout the whole film. And of course, the beast is the man's man. You know, it's right. the manliness of Kong yes, and, yes. Um, and of Jack Driscoll. Huh? <laughs> yes, yes. Gets conquered by the beauty. Oh, yeah. Just going back to you talking about you're getting information and character yeah. in kind of alternative bits. One of the information bits I love, um, which I've, I've never really noticed before, but um, they're going through, they're sounding depths and approaching the island. And um, Andara says, um, "How will we know it's the right, it's the uh, the right island?" 
Yeah. And um, Carl Dunham says, uh, it's got a mountain that looks like a skull. She goes, oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> <I'm> thinking, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's go to the, mount- the island with the mountain that looks like a skull. That sounds yes. like a... That would be fine. That would be absolutely fine. Um, but it's just... Yeah, she's not thinking, hang on, mountain looks like a skull. Do I want to go there? I'm not sure. <laughs> Surely the most memorable detail on the map was a, a thing saying, which I, I meant to pause and look at, but the one thing I glimpsed at, it said Skull Mountain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I will mention the Peter Jackson film here. One thing I preferred in the Peter Jackson film, mm-hmm. which I thought was really good, was the natives, they they live on the edge of the island and then I think yeah. I remember they're, they're almost zombie like they're malnourished there's mm. hardly any vegetation oh. they're really living on the edge because they can't get in on the other side of this wall is this lush jungle mm. probably full of wonderful fruit and animals to eat but they can't get in because of Kong and oh, other things yeah. um, whereas in this one the size of some of the natives are, is really quite large. There's one particularly <laughs> large woman, um, very well-fed woman, I should say, yeah. and it's just it doesn't have that. Yeah. You know, these 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 natives aren't hungry. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, talking of the natives, there's there's a bit that's that really typifies a lot of my favourite stories that um, yeah. makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. Is uh, Carl Dunham talks about uh, this island being somewhere where no white man has been before yes yeah um and that's very much it's in all the Ryder Haggard stuff really although he was a lot more um respectful of of other cultures because he's actually lived in Africa he lived in Africa yeah Yeah. um but there is that very much white man civilization yeah um black man natives all that kind of colonial stuff which which then was just the way the world was but now makes us feel uncomfortable and, and uh, is not is not the way that we want the world to be. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and of, you know, I did that stands out now. I think, and you do think, yeah. all, all, but it's the it's of the time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but I'm certainly happy for that to to not be included in modern versions. Yes, yeah. as one thing I'll say about watching old films, just like watching foreign films, one of the sort of pleasures you get from it is you're really absorbing two things at once is you're getting the story obviously but also you're noticing all the little cultural differences how they told stories and the the assumptions they made yes, and it's almost yes. like you're getting that much more information from a film because it's old or in the case of a Japanese film say because it's Japanese yes um, you notice all these little different things and that's just one of the pleasures I find from <laughs> watching an old film yeah that's a very good point actually um, I mean I know some people who will not watch a black and white film yeah and I just think they're so much the poorer for that mm. a, a good percentage of my favourite films are black and white and I do wonder sometimes if story this is what I'm worried I'm battling with a bit at the moment is am I a bit too prejudiced against just modern modern things just because they're modern yes yeah. I, and I really hope not but I battle with that as well yeah <laughs> um, I um, there seems to be a lot more concentration not in everything but a lot of the better films on really good quality story. Sometimes I'll just switch on the TV, oh, not for a long time, but it's happened, and you just catch the beginning of a black and white film, don't yeah. know anything about it, end up watching, think, oh my God, what a brilliant yeah. story. I just got so involved in that. Yeah. Um, it didn't matter that it had, um, I th- I'm particularly thinking of a war film, which I couldn't even remember the name of. I think I wrote it down. Um, and it had submarines that were obviously models and you know, yeah, the, yeah. You know, those huge waves that's done in the bath sort of thing <laughs> um, but the film was just so absorbing um, and story seemed to matter more to some degree, now that's not true of all modern films that they don't care about story at no, all but no. there's a lot more you get the blockbuster now Yeah, I'm going to talk about the modern Kong again and I think that Peter Jackson's King Kong was very much the blockbuster Whereas in the 1933 Kong, you have one T-Rex. I think <laughs> in Peter Jackson's you had three. There was yeah. an animator, I don't know if it was Max Fleischer, I don't think it was. Someone said, um, oh, yeah, if you have one mouse doing something funny, uh, we're going to have three mice doing it because it's three times as funny. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> um, and I think Peter Jackson had a bit of that about the film. Yeah. Um, right, um, it, you know, King Kong... Uh, Kong battles one T-Rex we're going to have three it's going to be so much better and it wasn't 
better. And in fact, the thing that ruined the film for me it was like a computer game. Yeah. As soon as they got there, there were a thousand dinosaurs trampling <laughs> down this thing, and it had no mystery about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a scene that Peter Jackson did do, which was they fall off things off the tree log into this pit of insects. Yes. Um, and that I just remember hating that scene. And actually, I didn't realise this. Mm-hmm. until recently was an original scene in the 1933 Kong but after screening it to a test audience Cooper mm-hmm. took it out yeah um, because it disrupted the flow of the narrative Pe- I think or they said people thought it was so horrible yeah seeing these people eaten by giant scorpions <laughs> or whatever they forgot that what was going on in the main action of the film yeah and they were sort of taken out of it and so when it came back to Kong they it, they sort of lost the main thread yes yeah. <laughs> so um, quite a technically um, impressive scene, I'm sure, mm. um, but but ruthless editing for the sake of the yes, story. Yes. And I do think it was too much. It's like a computer game. You go from one thing to the other with Peter Jackson's one, um, and it was just it just overdid it for me. Mm. And, and that did. I wasn't think I had. There was no mystery about the island. There was at first, as I say. I thought mm. that was really effective when they came and you see this impoverished coastline. Um, um, but now the other thing I think I, I don't want to just compare this with the Jackson's Kong but the Jack Black character the, the Carl Denham I think yeah um, he was constantly trying to make the film still at the expense of, at the expense of the people yeah um, whereas I think when once Anne Darrow was captured by Kong yeah he wasn't he, he didn't seem to be wanting to make the film he, he mm. was very much wanting to rescue the girl yeah. who was a bit more responsible wasn't he yeah although there is one moment I, I noted down that once they get um, Fay Ray back that's when Carl Denham switches back into yes. filmmaker mode but at least they've got the girl and back he, <laughs> and he says oh, I haven't got the quote now but he says oh we could you now we've got um, Fay Ray and Darrow back we could use her as bait. And you think, <laughs> no! <laughs> you know, that's the worst yes, thing. Yes, so he's the mercenary spirit yeah. still there. I mean, he's... he's but you're right, he her. does help them to yeah. uh, to rescue her. Yeah. And, um, of course, they come across dinosaurs in the island, which is pretty amazing. Mm. But then... Um, now, I did think, oh, they're not they're very bothered about the dinosaurs. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, hello, dinosaurs, amazing. But, of course, they 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 do seem to be quite concerned about getting... Fay mm. Rayback, which is good, um, but yes, there's the, the pearl dinosaurs. I mean, again, when they get back to New York, it's not. <laughs> and I found dinosaurs yes. as well. <laughs> oh, we lost Kong. Let's go back and get a, a Stegosaurus this time. <laughs> they may have killed the only Stegosaurus on the uh, island, of course. Although, uh, well, it's, it's interesting that Kong is. I mean, it's sort of obvious, really, that Kong is the the main focus of the film rather than dinosaurs and you wonder I mean, obviously it's because he's sort of slightly human yeah and you yeah. wonder because of course this was made I mean it, it's obviously not in Victorian times no. but you wonder how much there's still that leftover fascination with um, the primitive in man and the whole Charles Darwin thing oh, well that's always going to be interesting yes, to people yeah. um, and I uh, well it was made in America wasn't it now yeah you do wonder in the 20s you had the Scopes trial in America, which is quite a famous evolution versus creationism. Oh. Um, so that probably was only a few years, I couldn't tell you the exact year, 1925 yeah. or something, um, 24, 28, not sure. Um, so obviously that was a big, the whole, you know, apes, yeah. men, men coming from um, the common ancestor with apes was um, was quite a thing. So mm. in that context, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Did you ever hear of Kong? Why, yes. Some native superstition, isn't it? A god or a spirit or something. Well, anyway, neither beast nor man. Something monstrous, all-powerful, still living, still holding that island in a grip of deadly fear. Well, every legend has a basis of truth. I tell you, there's something on that island that no white man has ever seen. And you expect to photograph it. If it's there, you bet I'll photograph it. Suppose it doesn't like having its picture taken. Well, now you know why I brought along those cases of gas bombs. There's some there's some pretty amazing... What's, what's, what's your 
What do you think is your highlight of the film? What's your what's your favourite bit of the film, if there is one? <laughs> well, I suppose the thing that stuck in my mind most was a sequence, which is sort of in the middle of the film, so it might be a good point to talk about it now. There's, for, of course, first when you encounter Kong, he captures Fei Rei, and he's the villain, obviously, at this point. But then by the end, you're rooting for him. Yeah. Do you, you ever do you ever <clears throat> think Kong's a villain? Well, I Him being sort of an, did, uh, an animal, really. At first, he's introduced as a fearsome monster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose villain isn't the wrong word, but for a while, he's the focus of fear, and you think all we want to do is rescue Fei Ray from Kong. But then there's a point, and I, I wrote down this, this sort of three scene trick that happens. Right. <laughs> after which, your sympathies are very much with Kong. You're no yeah. longer looking at him just as an animal. Right. He's a, a hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. What happens is. Kong has got Fei Ray and he's being chased by the whole crew of the the ship. Yeah. And they come to that log over the chasm. Yeah. Kong puts Fei Ray in a tree, mm. turns around, grabs the log and shakes it and kills everyone but two people. <laughs> yes. At yes. that point he's obviously a monster. Right, right. Then um the hero, Jack Driscoll, who's the first mate, hides just underneath the ledge of the chasm. Yeah. Yep. And Kong is reaching round for him. And at that point, you you sort of want Jack Driscoll not to be found. But Kong pricks his finger on Jack Driscoll's knife. Yes. And you sort of, and he, he reacts to it just as you would if you pricked your finger. Yeah, he yeah. looks at it. Yeah. And I think that's the moment you stop seeing him as a monster and think, oh yeah, I can feel what he feels. Yeah, very good point. And we go yeah. from that then yeah. to Kong fighting the T-Rex... Yep. To protect who, Fei who Rei. Is, who is... Um, yeah, menacing Fei Rei. Menacing, yeah. So Kong <laughs> protects Fei Rei. Suddenly, he's the hero in that scene, mm. undoubtedly. Mm. So he's gone from being the monster yeah. to being a sort of hero which you can identify with in those three scenes. I think it's that one where he pricks his finger. Right. You look at it and you just can't help but think, ow. Yes. You know? <laughs> and that moment you feel what he feels. Yes. You've got a bond with him. Right. Which I think is a really interesting transition Yes, yeah. I, I, that's very that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, that leads on to a scene where um, Kong has taken Fei Rei to his cave. Yeah. Um, after fighting some, I also this is a bit weird. It looks like a plesiosaur of some kind. I don't know how that got up there because it's not a snake. It's got flippers. Yeah, it looks like a snake, but then you notice it's got. So it's a bit yeah. like the Loch Ness monster, which is some kind of plesiosaur or something <laughs> like that. Anyway, um, and there's the bit where. He's got Fei Ray in his hand and, yeah. and he's taking her dress off and yes. sniffing his fingers, which is <laughs> really that. I mean, that there's a scene to, to yes. kind of uh, stop you short, really, but very powerful. And, yeah, I wrote, and, I wrote down he, he peels her like a banana. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yes. Well, they're a bit more sensitive. sensitive yes. <laughs> um, is he thinking at that point? Do I want to eat this or marry it? <laughs> 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 that's brilliant um, oh and that for me is one of the iconic mm. scenes it's also a beautiful backdrop yeah um, you see a bit of the island um, and then of course she's uh, rescued yeah. uh, there's a bit of the pterosaur there as well yeah um, fantastically done yeah um, that really is, is kind of I think probably one of my favourite scenes yeah where it's Kong and Fei Rei and the, and the rescue scene uh, just because of the, the visual aspect but also the story aspect of, mm. of it where that connection is this is not is he he's not going to eat her surely now yeah. he's, he's a lot more interested I, again i'm going back to the, perhaps the bit slightly uncomfortable mm. white man a bit which is um he obviously has a lot of i mean they I, they didn't seem to sacrifice men we well they made yes didn't. we yeah. saw um, the earlier sacrifice was a woman yeah um so there's obviously something different about now Maybe it's just Fay Ray. Let's hope so. <laughs> Not uh, blondes. Although, what was that line that's quite funny? Oh, um, um, when um, oh, I can't remember. Well, Carl Denman blondes says when they arrive, isn't it? Yeah, blondes are scarce around here. <laughs> yes, blondes are scarce around here. So um, that's a possibility. Well, the anyway, line, the line before that I noticed was um, um, when Carl Denham and that lot have just encountered the natives in the middle of about to sacrifice this woman to mm, Kong. Mm. Uh, they're translating what's happening and someone says the girl there is going to be the bride of Kong right Carl Denham says great find out what they're going to do <laughs> <laughs> and you think it's obvious to everyone they're going to sacrifice her. well it, it does make you wonder actually is this 
Bride of Kong. Well, I mean, what does he do with the other victims? <laughs> I, I mean, you presume he eats them. Are the, I, well, I can't remember. Are there skulls? Just, are there bones in his cave? I can't remember no, now. I don't think. I think that part of the film is something you're not supposed to think about logically. Right. You're just supposed to feel the attachment Kong has for beauty. He's the beast. She's beauty. Yeah, yeah, sure. If you yeah. try and work out the physics, of it, <laughs> I think he. I mean, I was even thinking maybe Kong is a woman, female, not, uh, and. <laughs> You know, like, can't have babies because there isn't a male Kong. <laughs> and looking after these women is like looking after a baby ape. Right. But can't feed them properly, so they actually end up dying. So you can yes. Ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, you're right. Let's That's not go down tragedy. the... Um, <laughs> let's not go down thinking yeah. about it too logically. Um, one, one scene that really stood out for me watching it recently mm. is what I think is probably one of the most horrific parts in the film. It's actually quite brief. But it's when we're in New York. Yeah. Kong's climbing one of the buildings not the Empire State earlier than that and there's a woman asleep in her bed (laughs) and he grabs her obviously waking her up takes her out of the I mean can you imagine being this woman you're asleep in your bed having a very nice dream um, and suddenly you know your your covers move a bit and then you think hang on what's that and then suddenly this huge hand has come through the window yes taking you out let you scream a bit. Yeah. He's thinking, no, that's not Fay Ray. She's so actually, it is particularly Fay Ray he's after. Obviously, she's a brunette, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and he drops her. Yeah. So this woman's life, well, for all she, you know what it's like when you wake up. You think, where am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, fifteen floors up and dropped to her death. I mean, yeah. I, I just find that totally horrific. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, when they get to New York, mm. I lose interest a bit. Yeah. I'm. Um, this is my bias for adventure films I love the island yes, I want to explore yeah. it more one thing I liked about Peter Jackson's was um, I mean it's it's clearer but there's there's aspects of an ancient civilization. there's this kind of a roadway that all the, yeah, yes. the patasaurs come down which is the bit that ruined it for me but <sighs> and in fact in, in Kong when they see the gates they're obviously ancient because the captain of the ship says he suggests they might be Egyptian or something yeah yeah so there is that lost world aspect, which is really thing that gets me going. I love that kind of <laughs> the mystery. So when they get to New York, although it's exciting, um, I do lose a bit of interest. My my favourite stuff's on the island, the build up, and on the island. Mm. Um, next bit, it's still it's still great. I mean, you need an ending to the film. Yeah. Um. Um. But yeah, I mean, that's basically. It remind, I was I was thinking about Godzilla as well, which I. I said oh, Jurassic yes, Park yeah. is a descendant. I think Godzilla made what twenty years later. Which yes, must be as well. Yeah, that's almost like entirely the last section of Kong, mm, isn't it? Right. <laughs> One thing I thought was interesting about the last section is Kong fights two modern dinosaurs, where he, he we've seen him fight a pterosaurus flying. No, a pterodactyl. Sorry. No. <laughs> I think pterodactyl. No, I'm not a <laughs> dinosaur expert. I think pterosaur is the correct term. All right, that's right. Pterodactyl is is somehow incorrect. Right, Couldn't so we see Kong fight that strange snake creature, and then a flying dinosaur. Yes. And then when he gets to New York, he fights a an elevated train, yes. which is like the snake. Yeah, yeah. And then some planes, which are like the di- the pterosaur. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like they're saying. In his home, in the jungle, he's used to fighting dinosaurs. Yep. But in the modern world, he has to face... I mean, he sees them as the same of course. things, monsters. Yeah. That's yeah. why he fights them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, just a little note of interest, in, in one of those planes is Marion C. Cooper. Yes. And his, um, un- <laughs> his nameless <laughs> but equally important partner in filmmaking. Yeah. Um, a play, play the pilot and his gunner, I think. Well, Denham, the airplane's got it. Oh, no. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. Yeah, one thing that um, happens, of course, in when they get back to New York, isn't it? Because it's the Empire State Building. Mm. Is just before you see Kong on stage, you see our hero, J- Jack Driscoll, in a suit. Mm. And he's looking really uncomfortable. You know, the, t- the suit's too tight. I think he says it's the first time he's ever worn a suit. Right. And he's trying to adjust his collar because it's too tight. Yeah. And then you go to the stage and you see Kong mm. 
all um, strung up, yeah. you know, and that's why I think there's a parallel between the two characters. Obviously, Faye Ray is, you know, they're both in love with her, but you that's, see, they're yeah, both the beast. Very they're, interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're the man's man. Yeah. And both of them are slightly uncomfortable in civilization. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. And, and do you think that was intended? I don't know. I'm pretty that's sure. There's a question about all these things. Yeah. People analyze things. Sometimes I worry about. Yeah. analyzing things too much i mean not like this because that that's a very interesting point um sometimes people go really yeah. deep saying oh, i can see this and this there's no way the author meant any of that yeah. um but i think that's, that's a very interesting yeah. thing um and what about the ending the famous yeah last words it was beauty killed the beast <laughs> i i wrote down at one point while watching this film who is the villain because I thought, I'd, I don't know if you need a villain. You know, actually, this is one thing that might be interesting to discover while watching these different adventure films. Mm, yeah. Do they Are they all about just the thrill of going to another country and discovering it, something strange? It is the... Um, or does there have to be a villain? Yeah. And in this film, you know, it's difficult to identify that there is an actual villain. But I think the one who actually does things which sets off bad occurrences <laughs> is Carl Denham. And he's the one who is all saying... He's almost like giving excuses. He says, he says to the press, they say, oh, you know, they say something about Beauty and the Beast. It was, you know, mm. and he says, yeah, that's your angle. Yes, yeah. Even though he said it before, it's almost like he was hoping that they'd mention it. Right. And then at the end, who killed Kong? He says, no. oh, it was Beauty who killed Kong. Yeah, it was yeah. like he doesn't want to be identified as the villain. Right. But in fact, the two things that actually set off the whole action is Carl Denham and cameras I noticed right because <laughs> when they get to the island the the, sh the crew of the ship are unnoticed until Carl Denham starts filming mm. and then immediately the island has noticed them and of course that's when Faye Ray is kidnapped and everything starts off yeah and then once they get to London no London New York <laughs> yes. once they get to New York <laughs> King Kong is quite is is captured until the photographers start taking photos of flash, him yeah. and then he breaks free yeah, yeah. and it's almost like there's, there's you know there's this is this, this um i don't know but <laughs> yeah no, another interesting point yeah so um well i think have we done justice to king kong <laughs> yeah i think so i mean maybe we should say what do you think makes it an adventure this particular mm. thing obviously there's the journey to another world yeah um, yeah um i mean as far as i mean it's just dripping with adventure yeah uh, this is the, my trouble <laughs> defining adventure and in fact these 10 films are all slightly they don't particularly fit my no. fuzzy definition particularly but it, I just it just strips with adventure now it's got it's got people um, going off into the unknown and mm. grappling with when you said you know who's the villain yeah there's also this sort of environment or or it, it's it's a test against the world yes not just against people yeah. or even monsters or creatures mm. you're so it's 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 very much an external struggle there's yeah. not usually much internal struggle no. in these stories yeah. um it's almost like you've got modern people going back into the past and here they're fighting against savagery and primitiveness and animals yes yeah and it's almost like we're contrasting saying what we've lost by being civilized but that wild world is still out there well, and I think you can visit it's it. It's something that people still struggle with. Mm. It's our modern civilised brains yeah. uh, versus the natural world, mm. which you can never really trump. Yes. And um, this is us going up against it in, in whatever form, whether that takes the form of an island yeah. and an environment which can defeat you, you know, falling off mountains and drowning and all these tasks you have to do to get to your point mm. or a beast or a monster like kong who's a nat part of the natural world which you don't quite understand fully yeah we don't we don't know i mean we know we've got some connection yeah um if you if you believe in evolution obviously um you know that that's where we came from we're all connected if you don't then there's probably an even bigger um uh, sort of head-on collision between them yeah. i really think that's it it's the struggle Mm. struggle against the world and to try and understand it and control it which you never can no we we try as much as we can yeah um, but as the recent Japanese yeah um, earthquake and tsunami show 
it doesn't matter what you do yeah you're not going to win and of course one of the things in this it does actually have a sort of as well as the external struggle because it, it's got the beauty and the beast thing it's really about love bringing out the primitive or being a primitive part of man mm. and that's another even though they go to another isle, another world and they meet you know weird creatures they're still coming across the most primitive human emotional force yes and that's the driving impact throughout the yeah. whole film yeah <laughs> um it's interesting as well there's is there's not really i mean whose whose story is this mm. you say well it's kong's maybe or it's fey rays but there's no, no definite no it's a, um um protagonist yeah. as such is there um, but you don't notice a gap. You don't notice an absence, do you? It's a satisfying no, film to no. watch. I mean, who do you relate to most? I think it's. Is it that turn you said? Um, yeah. Do you end up relating to Kong most? Yeah. By the time he's on top of the Empire State Building, you're definitely feeling sorry for him. Yeah, you do feel sorry for him, and it's a, it's a tragedy at the end, isn't it? Really, mm. it's not mm. a triumph of human beings coming out of the wilderness. No, it's a tragedy because something you feel as though something pure purer than these civilised men yeah. has died because of civilization. Well, it's that messing with nature thing again which mm. is obviously in Godzilla mm. um, and and The Lost World um, the film because yeah. the, in, in the book it, I don't think the pterosaur actually wreaks any havoc No, um, apart from a little bit well, no, not, e not even I think there's some like news report of it being seen a couple of times Yeah, and then it disappears because yes. it, it's uh, got no flies off, whereas, yeah. whereas in the film you've got the Apatosaurus that causes damage and the same in Kong yeah. so it's messing you know messing with nature and suffer the consequences yeah yeah. Um, Kong should of course stayed on the island but it's that amazement that's the other thing about adventure stories it's that amazement when you get to the end mm. you're finding something amazing yes and it's it's been an effort to find that something amazing yeah. it's almost a reward yeah uh, for the viewer certainly you're taking a trip that's that's one thing actually with these adventure films you're going on that journey as well mm. and the best adventure films really do take you on that journey yes you're not just watching it yeah um you're involved in it and i think part of that is really getting those details right they're very little details so like kong checking the t-rex's jaw to yeah. make sure it's dead several times and just the way he's been so brilliantly brought to life mm. um but that, that takes attention to detail. Mm. And to do that, all those little things add up and bring you into the story so you're going on that adventure, you feel as though this is true. Yes. That's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. And the more you feel it's true, the more you're going on that adventure and the greater... When you when you hit that target at the end, the the, um, the greater the enjoyment, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, well, that's King Kong. Yes, a very enjoyable film. <laughs> yes, excellent. If you haven't seen the 1933 King Kong, definitely see it. I imagine most of you listening to this have seen it. Um, so just a few thoughts. Um, I expect we'll... Um, I don't actually know what we're going to do with this podcast yet. <laughs> um, Murray's got a blog, I've got a blog. We'll probably link to it on both of them. And it'd be great to have your comments on what you think mm -hmm. about it. Now... Um, we're going to do this for all the ten films, as I said. Um, we haven't really decided whether we're going to do them in the kind of arbitrary order I listed yeah. them, or whether we should do them chronologically. Yeah, I think maybe we should just, I don't know, jump around a bit. <laughs> do you prefer that? Yeah. Okay, so so the next film then would be The Man Who Would Be King. Mm. Unless we chose them randomly, that's a third option. I think, let's do it in the order you put them up. Right, okay, yeah. that's decided. <laughs> so the next one will be The Man Who Would Be King, uh, 1975 film... Uh, directed by John Huston, starring Michael Caine and Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're. Have you seen that before? I saw it at school. Oh right, and yeah. is that the last time you saw it? No, I think I've seen it on TV since. Once. Right. Mm. Um, well, school. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll talk about that later. Yeah. We won't get into. I'm just start discussing it now. <laughs> but we're both going to watch it again. Yes. Um, in the next week or two, see mm -hmm. how we go, um, and we'll come back and discuss that next time. So, uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for listening to our ramblings on King <laughs> Kong. Um, please look at the links to go to my blog or Murray's blog. And, um, as I say, leave some comments. And we'll, uh, hopefully, you'll join us for the next one um, in this series on adventure films. Okay, thanks very much. Bye.